let's get into it. I got sick this We're coming live a sea was from sexy Soho, me. Manhattan. Baby. I'm your host today. I think I'm This the Roy K. Way Show, the second the episode. Everybody, get your hands up high if you're feeling sexy. Hey. What the fuck it ain't? Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. Welcome to the second episode of the Roy K-Way Show. I go by the name of Roy K and we kicked it off with a little bit of Marvin Gaye because we're feeling sexy, we're feeling good. I just got over a massive two-day hangover and I'm feeling all spry with types of energy. We then transition into my track, Wheezy inspired this. And the reason why I wanted to start with that is not only because it's my song and one of my favorite songs, but it's actually the GOAT's birthday today. I know pretty much everybody that's watching this episode here definitely has a thing for Wheezy at Baby. So if you haven't, go wish him a happy birthday. That's the guy that inspired pretty much all my rap career, a lot of the things I do today, and even this podcast, because he has a podcast of his own that's really doing waves. So everybody, give Wheezy at Baby a happy birthday today. Now, I wanted to switch the tone up of this episode from the previous episode where I was rambling on and on about how much the Giants suck. So we're leaving that one in the past and we have some interesting music that just dropped. But I thought it would be a little bit more interesting and I could give you guys a little bit more value if I brought someone who's been making waves in the music industry for a very long time, someone who has carved out his own lane, someone who has really made an impact in the New York City scene in terms of the Irish rock music scene. He actually goes by Larry Kerwin, and he's actually my father. He is the lead singer and guitarist of the iconic band Black 47. He is a playwright, a songwriter, and he's a heck of a dad. Everybody make some noise for Larry Kerwin. Come on down, baby. Introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah, I'm Larry Corwin, and uh, I fathered this guy, so I must be all right. Yeah, you, you know you're a legend <laughs> if you did that. So the real reason why I wanted to I'm, bring... I'm a real stallion. Yeah, yeah, he's, 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 Larry, he's Larry the Stallion. <laughs> um, so the real reason why I wanted to bring on my dad today was his resume speaks for itself. He was the lead singer and guitarist of a very iconic band, Black 47, for over 25 years. They performed throughout New York City. He's been doing his own shows and live gigs. And I know many of you guys are artists, whether it be, you know, a musician or, you know, actually in like the graffiti scene, or maybe you guys are videographers. And one thing that we all are craving is to get into that industry. And one thing that we're all searching for within that is that one break, that one moment that can really set you up. So what I actually really want to start with was, you know, getting a little bit more into your story and, you know, to kick things off, I thought a good question would be, you know, when did you ultimately know that the nine to five life was not your arena? That wasn't in the cards for you. You really had a vision. You had a career that you wanted to chase. When did you know that you wanted to get into music full time? I'd say I was about 21, but I was in Ireland at the time and I had a good job, but I was playing, I was in bands, and uh, I actually owned my own record company. But I felt like I needed to broaden my whole experience, and I just hopped on a plane, got a student visa, came to New York, went to live on East 3rd Street in, uh, around Avenue B back in the early 70s, and it was wild there. And as much as anything else, that uh, influenced me and gave me so much experience of life in a different form than it had been in Ireland. Um, so I'm still in lots of ways drawn on that. And I guess I was here three years illegally. I couldn't go back. 
uh, because I wouldn't have been allowed back into the country. And when I finally got documented, I went home to Ireland for a month's visit and realized I could never move back there, that I was addicted to New York City and came back and I've been here ever since. So to follow up on that, you know, one of the things that was a little bit difficult for me when I started off as a musician was dealing with not so much backlash, but I'd say kind of like side eye views from maybe family members and friends. Did you deal with any of that when you were coming up or how did you deal with that if so? I think I'm still dealing with it. <laughs> it's, that's something that never goes away because it, it, it has to do with yourself that you have to feel like you have something to offer. But at the same time, you, you won't be getting a lot of acclaim early on. And by the time you do get it, it may not mean that much to you. But yeah, you know, your friends won't uh, at first acknowledge what you are and then you'll lose some of the friends. Uh, but eventually you'll find the, the path you want to be on and it won't be easy. You gotta, you gotta remember that that it's always a struggle to be an independent artist. And, uh, you know, you got to stick at it and you got to be prepared for poverty. That's one thing <laughs> that's always going to be lurking on your shoulder, that things can go wrong. It was easier in ways for me because back in the 70s, 80s, 90s even, it was easy to get an apartment for, you know, two, three hundred dollars and... Uh, live you know get a couple of gigs a week and you were doing okay now there's so much expectancy on you to come up with rent money and uh, for your family to see that you're a success but there will come times when you're face to face with failure and you have to deal with it and that's when you find out whether you're really going to be an artist or not and you know to kind of piggyback off that question you had mentioned kind of the the preparing for poverty aspect was there ever one specific moment where you looked up maybe you're in a jail cell maybe you're I think I, I think you can acclaim to that maybe you're you know in an apartment you hate living in was there ever one moment where you looked up and said shit I made a huge mistake it's time to go back to accounting or that previous life no but there'll be no matter what happens you're gonna have dark nights of the soul and there's one I remember, actually, now you bring it up. I was back in Ireland on vacation, and uh, I had a record deal. The record deal fell through. My partnership with my friend was breaking up. And I remember thinking, man, I put so much into this. And now I'm faced with failure. And uh, it was a long night. And the following day, or two days later, I came back to New York and had to just start all over again. So you will meet those times. And uh, it's important that you hold yourself together at those times and uh, know that everyone uh, has those dark nights of the soul. And then to kind of flip it over on a more optimistic angle, <laughs> at what moment did you look at yourself in the mirror and said, wow, I really created something meaningful. I've really come in and carved a lane for myself in the New York City scene. I am now an iconic voice. I'm now doing all the things that I love to do. Was there ever like that one moment? Yeah, if you're on a big TV show or something, you might look at yourself in the monitor. Which and one? Oh, we were on all of them, on Letterman, Leno, O'Brien, MTV, Fallon, whatever. So, but the thing is, you're in such a kerfuffle at those times because you're just so busy. You don't really have time to stop back and think, you know, I'm making it or something. You're, you're kind of like on the back of a stallion and you're holding on to it and you're jumping fences and you're trying to trying to maintain your equilibrium. So yeah, there are times when you, you say, wow, I'm on Letterman, that's, that's something, or you know, I'm on Fallon, uh, or I'm on MTV and people recognize you, but you're really too busy thinking about the next move all the time. Yeah, and there's, there's one thing as an artist that I've always kind of thought to myself is like, I'd rather be 
hated by 50,000 people and loved by a thousand. I feel like that's how you really kind of become an icon. You really become someone who people are not a fan of, but they're actually support through the ups and downs. So based off that, I know that you had a lot of radical views within your songs and you know, you definitely were a controversial figure of sorts. Was there ever a moment where you felt like you might have pissed off the, the higher ups in the industry? Oh, we did that continually with Black 47 because we were, we were political right from the start. We were interested in getting civil rights in Northern Ireland and we fought and worked for that. Uh, but that was kind of a popular stance. I'd say the hardest one was when we came out against the invasion of Iraq and everyone was kind of for it at that point, or a lot of people were for it. And uh, a lot of our fans were for it. So going on stage was every night for about three years was just, uh, it was hard, you know, because people were walking out, people were breaking your CDs and whatever, but you had to think, I'm right. I know I'm right in this. And we were, that it was a huge mistake. And then it wasn't that anybody said in the end, you're right or ending, but they, in the end, people stayed and were dancing to the songs that they were walking out from before. So, yeah, that was a, a rough three years because we gave up so many gigs. We were, uh, we were really big on this series of festivals throughout the U.S., and all of a sudden we were canceled on all of them. So it wasn't just the fame thing, right? It was actually money. How am I going to live, you know? How am I going to support you? <laughs> so it does get down to the nitty gritty. And the times like that, you, you have to say, I'm right. Everyone else is wrong. The great Irish playwright Oscar Wilde said that unless people dislike what you're doing, you're not doing something new. And I always had that. I knew I was doing something new because so many people disliked what I was doing. Yeah, and to you know, kind of go off that, the reason why I wanted to ask that question is today in the industry, there are a lot of controversial characters who, in my mind, are the most entertaining. They make some of the best music, but in a way, a lot of the people in the industry, um, the DSPs, which are you know like Apple Music, Spotify, the streaming services, in a way are trying to censor them, trying to blackball them. And even if, you know, they've done terrible things, I kind of feel like in, in a way I root for them just because I am anti the, you know, the corporations and just kind of the, the higher ups that really try to play a message off in their favor. Well, most corporations are interested in making money. So I think you might be overestimating that you know that as long as they're making money they'll put up with pretty much any amount of controversy um, so I wouldn't worry about that there'll be moments you know where you will have stepped beyond their bounds but usually they catch up with you and are willing to go along what you're doing as long as you're making money for them and there are a lot of good people in the um, music business. The music business gets a lot of slamming, but I, can, I was with three different major record labels uh, over the years. And, you know, there were a lot of people who didn't know what they were doing, but there were a lot of people within those labels, um, like Pete Ganbark, who is one of the heads of Atlantic, um, he signed Black 47 when people didn't want us to do, didn't want him to do it, um, and they, they stuck with us right through it. So there are the gems in the music business. So you shouldn't slam the whole music business because there are good people in it who are trying to do the best they can and are trying to get what they consider the good talent out there, and. Controversy is just one thing, you know, it's just part of life in the business. Definitely. And, you know, to go into kind of the label end, I know that signing to a label is drastically different back in the day than it was now. Pretty much you can be your own label at this point. You can be independent and you can put your music on streaming services. You can pay for all your music videos if you build the relationships you can go to people at radio but 
at the same time, there's definitely a lot of work that goes into that being an indie artist. So one question that I had for you was seeing that you've been through a few labels. What do you think the right time, and every artist is obviously a different story, but what's the right time for an artist to start looking for representation in the industry? And what are some things that they should look out for maybe when they are going into that initial contract process? Well, if you can do it yourself, and it's easier to do it uh, yourself nowadays than it was, if you can do it yourself, stay independent. Because for one thing, it's really hard to hold on to your masters if you're involved with a, one of the big um, record companies. And your masters are everything. Like, I, I write books also. Uh, in, uh, in the book publishing world, the publisher has to have your book out there you know, on shelves in, in stores. And if not, you can take it back from them. So I have various books back. But when I made CDs, say, for the big companies, that was it. It's over. They own the CDs from that point on. And why I would say hold on to your masters is because there's not that much money because of streaming anymore. Um, but where the money will be is, say, getting your songs and movies or getting them used in ads. And you can, if you own the masters, you get that money, not the record company. So as much as you can, hold on to the primary source. Yeah, and one of the points I kind of wanted to make to build off that is one of my big regrets as a musician. Um, I'm weighed down with a lot of other responsibilities, so it's tough to time manage. But one of my biggest regrets is not really learning how to produce my own music so that I could be in full ownership of it. That way you can really craft your own sound and your own wave with it as well. So I think my, my advice and I'm going to let him kind of close things off with a little bit of advice. But if there are any younger artists out there, I would definitely advocate that you learn how to produce your own music, learn how to mix and master it so you can save yourself money on not only like the studio time, but also in terms of getting your masters when you're finding beats on YouTube or from whoever, they're also licensing out those beats to several other artists. So in terms of that ownership, you're definitely putting yourself at risk there. So that would be my kind of closing advice here but to give the man of the moment Mr. Larry Kerwin you know a last final statement if you had any closing advice to an artist you know the one thing that they might not be thinking of right now that could really help them along the way what would you say to them well I would amplify what you said before um, that you should learn how to produce your own music nowadays it's so easy uh, you you know you can get equipment at home, you know, for two, three thousand dollars where you can you can make your own masters. So learn how to do that. But I would go a little further even if say, for instance, you go to work on a ship or you go to work in a hotel to become a manager or a manager of a hotel or captain of a ship. You have to go and work in every department. You have to know how to how each department works right from washing the dishes up until taking bookings, you know, everything, you have to learn that. And that's the way I would look at the music business. Learn how to do publicity, how to write your own biography, all these things, you can do it. It's, it's all there, it's been laid out many times. And uh, learn most of all how to make your own music and how to say, I'm right, you know, because I see young musicians going into studios and they're in awe of the uh, engineer or the producer in there. But remember, it's, it's all just a matter of taste. Now you have to learn how to do things like the engineer, but in the end, you're the one who should be calling the shots and say, no, I hear it a different way. Let's go that way. And everyone from John Lennon to Public Enemy to everyone that's recording today did that. You have to be the loudest voice in the room sometimes, even down to making a mistake. Because when you make a mistake once, you'll learn from that and you won't make that mistake again. So get out there, learn how to do it and, you know, 
Remember the big words are, I am right. If I'm right, it'll all fall into place eventually. Again, because you only, you had the vision of what you want the final product to be and, you know, to add on to that. I learned how to mix and master to a certain extent. I still use my people at the brewery studio. Shout out to them. But I definitely feel more confident when I have a little bit of touch beforehand because I know definitely how I want my voice to sound, how I want it to transition in and out. So I think that's definitely a vital point. I know I said this was the closing statement, but I'm not letting you off that easy. I'm putting you on the spot right now. My mom is in the other room, so maybe we'll get the PG story. But I do want to hear the craziest tour story that you ever have. Boom, you're on the spot. Let's go. Well, there were so many with Black 47, but I think one of the, the hardest ones and the funniest ones was showing up in the right town, but in the wrong state <laughs> between Michigan, <laughs> looking at Michigan, MI, and Wisconsin, and looking, driving around looking for the place we were to play in a place called Whitewater in Michigan, and when we were supposed to have white water in Wisconsin, that was a revelation. That was definitely the answer I was looking for right there. <laughs> Once again, this man goes by the name of Larry Kerwin. Everybody give him a big hand right now. He's stepping off. I think that was a valuable lesson right there. And that concludes episode number two of the Roy K-Way show. The ne next episode, we're going to get into some deep topics. I want to have more guests on as well. So if you feel like you could add some valuable insight to the show, hit me up and we'll make it happen. Let's go.